Columbia New Museum. I'm the manager of adult public programs and really excited to partner with the Brooklyn Institute for Social, Social Research and the New York Review of Books to um, facilitate this program tonight. Um, you're surrounded by works right now in our current exhibition, Memory Palaces, inside the collection of Audrey B. Heckler. Um, it is an incredible range of self-taught art um, from the time period that Benny B was writing until today. Um, I have a little public programs plug that I'm going to do. If anyone's interested in learning more about the exhibition, we have a whole slate of lectures, workshops um, that are going on. Feel free to grab a flyer on your way out. And when we have the reception from around 9 to 9.30, I encourage everyone to walk around and look at the work. A little museum rule, um, food and drink are only allowed in the aging space where we're sitting now and in the hallway, but I encourage you guys to explore the galleries a little bit during that time. So um, without further ado, I'll welcome our moderator for tonight's program, Christine Smallwood. Thank you for being here tonight. Christine, I'm going to be moderating this amazing panel. Um, we want to say thanks to the museum for hosting us, to New York Review of Books for everything they do, um, to the Brooklyn Institute, and to all of you for coming tonight. And I'm going to start by introducing our four panelists all at once, and then they're going to each give um, some brief opening remarks to help situate our conversation. And then I'll have some questions for them, and then we'll open it up to more general um, questions and comments and conversation. Okay, so directly to my left is Jay Chowdhury. He's executive director of the Brooklyn Institute and a core faculty member specializing in social and political theory. Jay's research focuses on social and political theory, Frankfurt School Critical Theory, political economy, political ecology, media, religion, and post-colonial studies. He has written for many publications and is currently working on a book of political theory for the Anthropocene. To a Jay's left is Suzanne Schneider, who is Deputy Director of the Brooklyn Institute, an interdisciplinary scholar working in the fields of history, religious studies, and political theory. Suzanne's research interests relate to Jewish and Islamic modernism, religious movements in the modern Middle East, the history of modern Palestine and Israel, and the history of violence. She is the author of Mandatory Separation, Religion, Education, and Mass Politics in Palestine, and is currently working on a book about contemporary jihad and the changing nature of violence in the West. To Susie's left is Hermione Obi. Hermione is the author of the novel Neon in Daylight. Her second novel, Small Gods, is forthcoming from Riverhead. She writes about she writes about books and culture for The Guardian, The New Yorker, The New York Times, and other publications. And finally, we are so fortunate to have with us Tess Lewis, an award-winning translator and the translator of this edition of the Storyteller Essays. Her translations include works by Peter Hankin, Klaus Merz, Hans Magnus, Enzensberger, I'm so sorry, I'm slaughtering everything, Christine <laughs> Hanga, Pascal Bruckner, and others. She is co-chair of the Penn Translation Committee, advisory editor for the Hudson Review, and her essays and reviews have been published in many journals. Um, so we're going to start with Jay. Hello. Uh, it's a little funny, though, sort of being in this space. Uh, the objects that I taught a banking class at the Night Book Art Museum, the sort of Queen's Gallery that is open now. Um, but like so many of the objects are in the same that's like having the hour point to the moment. Um, that is a perfect thing to talk about for like uh, what Benjamin is interested in with storytelling and with things like folk art and with things uh, that he categorizes as a kind of uh, collective or communicable experience. So <laughs> what, what, what does this mean? Um, I feel almost guilty of doing this to you, so it's because I know this is a passage you love. Um, but I'm going to... Yeah, so, um, and I'm going to read from uh, Tessa's brilliant new translation, which is extremely good. I know it's like, I feel like you're to say that, but it's going on. It's extremely good. Um, and, Encounters with people who know how to tell a story properly are becoming ever rarer, 
and even more frequently, an awkward silence spreads through the group when someone exper expresses the wish to hear a story. It's as if a capacity we have considered inalienable, the most reliable of all of our capacities, has been taken from us, the ability to share experiences. But one reason for this state of affairs is obvious. Experiences stop has fallen in value. And it seems this fall will never end. Every glance at a newspaper confirms that its value has reached a new level, that not only our image of the external world, but also of the, of the moral world has suffered changes overnight, which once were thought which were once thought impossible. With the World War, it became clear that a process had begun and it, it has not stopped to this day. Didn't everyone notice at the end of the war that men returned from the battlefield completely new, not richer in experiences they could share, but poorer? What streamed into the flood of books about the war that appeared 10 years later was anything but the kind of experience that flows from one mouth to the next. And this was not surprising. For experiences have never been refuted more thoroughly than strategic ones were by trench warfare, economic ones by inflation, physical ones by mechanized warfare, ethical ones by the ruling powers. A generation that had gone to school in horse-drawn streetcars found itself under an open, under open sky in a landscape in which only the clouds were unchanged, and below them, in a force field crossed by devastating currents and explosions, stood the tiny, fragile human body. So it's a pretty bleak opening, um, but the thing that's sort of running through it, right, is this sense of loss, right? Um, but Benjamin's relationship to loss is a little bit funny. Um, this beautiful uh, sort of section in the middle of the arcades project come with him for anyone who is really interested in sort of any new stuff. Um, where he's going through his own methodology and he's like, wants to, he says, I want to annihilate the concept of progress in history. Right? This idea that there's necessary progress in history by the, the famous version of the sort of Hegelian liberal version of the, the arcade history is long and then switches, right? Uh, but he's like, no, that, that can't be the case. But at the same time, he also doesn't want to revert to a sort of romantic conservative version. He also says, I want to annihilate the concept of decline. So when he's looking at this idea that communicable experience has sort of has entered, it has been damaged, he's thinking about the present moment, right? It's not so much that we're going to go back and recreate an ideal community that exists in the past. He actually refers to sort of tradition as a phantasmagoria you can get lost in, just like sort of um, Austin. But rather, we, we our own capacities to share in a certain kind of collective communicable experience have been uh, injured, like neurologically, like you can't actually do them uh, in modern capitalist society. And he separates this, and pardon me for butchering the German, I will do this because I'm someone who reads but doesn't speak German, um, into sort of two categories, which sort of then lead to a third. The first is um, erlebnis, kind of version of experience that is individualized, atomized, right? Um, and it's really funny because it's the version of experience that you can really often use for like going on an adventure. Um, so it seems like the better one in some ways. Um, and he contrasts this with their um, which is again translates easily as experience, but it's also like the kind of experience you put on a resume, like I know how to use Microsoft Office, like my experience in that. Um, but weirdly, he elevates that version to the one that is the potentially collective shared experience, the one that we might all share uh, together um, that will give us some kind of consciousness. Um, and these are the sort of key terms for Benjamin about storytelling uh, and some, several of these other interesting things that he's interested in, right? Uh, they are collective experiences, right? When we listen to a story, when we tell a story, we are working. Uh, we are working in a group. It, it's from collective material, and it's for a collective audience. Um, and again, the comparison which uh, he makes in the essay, but it is even clearer if you read it, say, alongside the work of art essay, um, is to, for example, a film of audience, right? Um, so again, the idea that he's uh, that he's sort of reaching backwards as opposed to reaching into the present um, would be sort of a flaw. Um, it's uh, so. Let me see, I have a lot of my own little place here. So, the interest in storytelling, uh, as with, say, for art, um, is actually in recovering something sort of formal, right? How is it that we can, uh, how can we have storytelling in this moment? What would it look like? And I think that's a question that some of the other panelists will probably address more directly. Like what does storytelling now look like? What does it involve? What can it involve? Um, for Benjamin, he's really 
kind of the way in which, for example, plasma cinema, um, right, when you see the stories together, um, as with uh, architecture, for example, <coughs> modern architecture in particular, you receive stories uh, not just through direct attention, but through habit and through just, uh, even through distraction. Um, and he's also interested in the way that storytelling uh, is a kind of historiography, right? It links up memory, um, it's very much from the arcades material, it links up memory um, uh, as opposed to sort of this like informational, atomized, sort of journalistic experience um, into a constellation that can have a historical resonance in the present. And, you know, probably reaching, how, how much time? I think it's time. Okay, cool. Um, Good, and so the idea of having any of these stories or these constellations, right, this version of history, this version of cinema, this version of storytelling, any of these, these possible processes, is that we might be able to come to have some kind of consciousness of the moment. And like, why is that, why does that happen? Right, if everything I just told you is true, if, if anything doesn't actually care about the lost thing for its own sake, like, why is it that we should care? about this thing that maybe is in decline. And the answer, I think, is not found directly in the storyteller essay, but it's more directly pronounced in, say, the work of art, or in the essay of surrealism, and several of and other works from this period, um, where he says very explicitly, you know, once the sort of question of beauty uh, sort of starts to fade, the question of politics rises. And when anyone is thinking about the things that uh, can facilitate our expansion of our consciousness, and this, it's really funny that it sounds like 1787, 1869, or something like that, right? Um, he really needs it. Like, he really thinks that, uh, for example, with the photographic technology or with storytelling, um, we can have a greater sense, a greater sensory experience of the world, and thereby possibly have a greater potential for political consciousness. And here again, and I'll see what I'll probably stop for, uh, World War I enters back into the picture. Because, uh, this opening passage that I read is, of course, Benjamin reflecting on war literature that came out um, in his time. Right? Uh, very famously, Benjamin went to these like um, sort of like utopian children's camps in Germany, and all these buds from from those circles like went off to war. They're like, "We have a war," and he didn't. He was like, "What the fuck?" I thought we were about like nature and love and shit. Um, and they all go off to war, and you know what comes back? He says, and it's a an, they really got the uh, experience in poverty essays in here, and another one that goes in that series is the um, Thirty-six German Fascism, um, where he literally talks about people like Ernst Jünger. It's like they came back spewing nonsense. Like they were like these are the books that you know that American readers uh, for the for a long often think of like Vermont Gay as the only author. But these with uh, Ernst Jünger and writers like that were like war is the greatest thing ever. War is the one time in my life I was able to really alive. Um, they all were critics of the Nazis uh, eventually from the right. They were like, yeah, stop selling my good warfare with your like, race science stuff. I want to make better warfare. Um, and then you look at this and said, these people aren't communicating, right? They actually, their, their senses are somehow broken. Um, and he thought of this not just as a theory of the war, but as a general theory of society. Um, so the sort of general crisis of Marxism, right? Why didn't people turn to the revolution as opposed to nationalism? Becomes a theory of what is broken about modern capitalist society that also breaks people. And reaching for all these answers, reaching back to try to figure out well, what would be the storytelling of the present moment, for many is very political. Um, if we could reach and have storytelling of the present moment, storytelling that connects us in a sort of pregnant way to the possibility, to the historical and real technological possibilities of our moment, there is a way in which we could still sort of. Uh, emerge on the road. Uh, and with that, I'll stop. Okay, um, so thank you all again for coming out uh, to the American Folk Representative for having us. It's, oh, we, were, we were told to speak for five minutes, which is very, <laughs> which is really not, which I don't mean to speak for more than, it's very hard to speak for five minutes about something that's very dear to you, as this essay is to me. Uh, I will give it a try. Um, I really, uh, this is an essay that I've loved since I encountered it very early in graduate school, but I have to say that my relationship with it has changed in kind of interesting ways since I had children. 
So I'm going to do the thing that young female academics are never supposed to do, and I'm going to talk <laughs> about my kids. Um, so this might all sound kind of you know sweet, but uh, there's um, you know I have uh, twin daughters who are nearly nine, and we hear something in our house. Um, uh, though they are always kind of hungry for stories, I also get a lot of I'm bored by constantly. Um, and my response, uh, ever informed by this essay, is usually something like, great! Um, but that doesn't seem to help matters much. And then sometimes I wistfully remark that I wish I would have time to be bored. Um, but that doesn't really go over well either. So maybe then you use not the best guide to parenting. Um, <laughs> But boredom, uh, which Benjamin equates with this capacity to be self-forgetful, occupies a place of privilege in the storyteller. I'm just going to read a quick passage for you here um, from Tessa's uh, gorgeous new translation. It says, the more naturally the storyteller avoids all psychological shading, the greater will be the story's claim to space in the listener's memory. And the more thoroughly a story is integrated into the listener's experience, the more likely he will be to recount it and pass it on sooner or later. This process of assimilation, which takes place deep inside us, requires a state of relaxation that is becoming ever rarer. If sleep is the height of physical relaxation, then boredom is that of mental relaxation. Boredom is the dream bird that broods the egg of experience. A rustling in the leaves is enough to scare it away. It nests. Those, uh, those activities intimately connected to boredom have already died out in the cities and are declining in the countryside as well. With them, the gift of listening is being lost, and the community of listeners is disappearing. So, boredom, if it is this kind of state of total mental relaxation that's no longer available to us, um, kind of bombarded as we are on all sides by information and sensory stimulation. And here, uh, another idea that Benjamin develops elsewhere about the, uh, the experience of shock being central to the experience of modernity seems to be of uh, the utmost relevance. And being bored thus becomes a problem, much in the way it is of my nearly nine-year-old daughters. Uh, and it leaves us seemingly too nakedly exposed to either our own thoughts or to those of others. Um, and we fortunately have much to turn to in order to avoid this intimate and but uncomfortable encounter. I've often ridden the subway kind of nonchalantly while looking at the news on my phone and thought of Benjamin. Every morning news reaches us from around the world and yet we lack remarkable stories. Right? Here's a sampling from today. Matt Kohler lists swanky Manhattan penthouse for $29.5 million, Wall Street Journal. Bernie Sanders' daughter-in-law dies from cancer shortly after being diagnosed, Fox News. Or championship boxer ejected from Ferrari <laughs> in Dallas crash. Not funny, but kind of serious. <laughs> what are we to make of these and the society that consumes them? If we seek wisdom in the story and the meaning of life in the novel, what do we seek in this exchange of information? What does it do for us to know that a man was killed in California by his neighbor? This question is key for me, and I can't say I have a definitive answer. I'm curious to hear others' thoughts. But while I'm kind of riding the train, you know, browsing these types of headlines, I've often thought I'd be better off asking the person standing or sitting next to me to tell me about where they were born. Uh, but then I'd risk being that weirdo who strikes up conversations with strangers on the train. Um, but still, there's nothing that speaks more to me about our kind of inability to communicate experience, uh, to hear that of another and to weave into the fabric of our own, than the quiet train of people absorbed in their own reading, whatever the type. Finally, I want to uh, close by drawing our attention to something else uh, about the nature of information that Benjamin picked up on, and that I think leads to a certain collapse of imagination, both political, as Jay mentioned before, but also aesthetic. The headlines I shared above have the um, quality of being verifiably true. Uh, indeed, reporting the facts correctly is the mandate and the obsessive quest of journalism, often spoken of uh, in almost reverential terms as shining light onto darkness, revealing what was there all along. Now, the constant quest for what really happened has not surprisingly penetrated the way that many of us relate to stories, and arguably the nature of writing itself. 
And Christine, I know you are going to ask a burning question about the personal essays, uh, which are uh, uh, enjoying a moment in the critical sun, but I think it's hard to appreciate their popularity without taking stock of the implicit judgment that links authenticity and truth to fact. Many of us are so accustomed to fact being the most crucial element of the story that we encounter that we barely even register that privileging it means neglecting others. Yet, in the years that we have spent reading stories aloud with our children, including many with clear roots in the craft of storytelling, uh, such as rabbinic midrash or fairy tales, it's given me a glimpse of a different set of concerns. Only very recently has the question, but did it really happen, start to enter our conversations about fantastical events, great miracles, and animals that come to the rescue, showing, in many means terms, that nature is not beholden to myth, but prefers to gather around mankind. There <clears throat> were simply more interesting things to talk about than whether it really happened. And I would be lying if I didn't admit that when questions of the sort started to appear with some regularity, it felt like an unwelcome intrusion. The surest evidence that our children were growing up and were being socialized in a particular type of world. But I don't want to end on a nostalgic note, uh, kind of uh, picking up on uh, kind of, uh, something adjacent prior, and I think it's rather more important to think about what types of narrative that we do have, or that we can create, that might give expression to the human longing to transmit experience, and maybe even offer counsel for both ourselves and for others. Doing so would seem to require defying the structural forces that make us scattered and disdainful of boredom. I'm not entirely certain how that happens, but that's among one of the questions we'll take up tonight. Thank you. Okay, I um, am going to take a more granular approach to thinking um, because I had to wrestle with them um, literally on a syllable by syllable um, basis. So one thing that AJ mentioned is his playing with languages um, with words. What the German language um, allows is a manipulation of the different um, prefixes or suffixes or logical echoes and playing. So for example, with the Erfahrung and the Erlebnis, the way he uses them isn't actually, I mean, he, he forces them into a kind of corset. So, I mean, you could say, okay, Erlebnis has Leben in it, so it's kind of an experience that you live through. And Erfahrung is a more directed, more, um, mas more of a mastery of experience, but they're not really that strictly divided in German. Um, and so I had to, to wrestle with this, and what I thought was extremely interesting in this collection, um, I didn't edit it myself. Um, I was very lucky to work on this with um, Samuel Titan, who's a, an academic in um, Sao Paulo, who has taught this forever, fell in love with it, and um, noticed as he worked with Benjamin that Benjamin cannibalized his own work and would reset it, rework it, change it. And so I tried in the few um, excerpts that I gave you, I tried to trace in sort of broad brushstrokes and miniature what he does with this El Favre. So it starts with, um, in 1932, in an unpublished, uh, well, it was um, not published during his lifetime. So that probably means that he was not completely happy with it, where he plays off El Favre and Aeneas. And then he has to keep his theory on it doesn't work. And in the last sentence, he has a to Erfahrung, which is knowledge gained from experience, sort of, but not really. Then one year later, he's talking about private experience and the experience of humanity as a whole. So you can see he's still kind of wrestling. How is he going to get all the subtleties and nuance out of his concept of experience? Um, and finally, by the time he gets to the storyteller, you see him not only changing his idea of experience, but his idea of what the proverb can do. He's given up on the proverb as this communicator of wisdom, or not given up on it, but he finds that it's only useful in a few situations, whereas before it seemed this beacon of, you know, no leaning tendre um, broadcast of of wisdom. Now it's more like, well, it really has to be a storyteller who's integrating all 
the, his own lived experience and the lived experiences of others and then cleansing those particulars from the experience itself so that it's distilled into its essence which can be passed on as counsel. Um, to give another example of how he plays with these um, syllabic building blocks, um, I took from section 16, he plays with mut, which is courage. And he says, the fairy tale divides courage dialectically between two poles of cunning and audacity. And if you see in the German, he uses Untermut, which is not a German word, and that's why he himself has to put a, you know, he has to give his readers a little bit of a guide. Mut is a fabulous word because it is courage. And then if you say Hochmut, that's arrogance. If you say Demut, that's humility. So it has, it's a whole rainbow, a whole panoply of meanings that can be attached to Mut depending on how you manipulate it, what you add, what you subtract, what context you put it in. Um, another example of trying to develop his ideas at the same time that he's manipulating his vocabulary is in the last paragraph of section 13, where he plays with three different German words for memory, which are really kind of just, I suppose I could have put commemoration in there for the eingedenken, but that wouldn't quite have worked. So, Erinnerung, Gedächtnis, Eingedenken, bring the German speaker a whole host of associations which may or may not fit, but that's the beauty of Benjamin, actually, is he can, he likes to play off these resonances Sometimes responsibly, sometimes irresponsibly, but it leaves you, it always leaves you sort of daydreaming about, you know, brooding on the end of experience about what it uh, could be. Um, another example of what he does is use these impossible words. Um, Again, compound words or turning nouns into verbs, verbs into nouns, which you can do more uh, smoothly in German. He calls Johann Peter Hebel a vergegenwärtiger ohne Gleichen. So he says in two words what took me, I don't know, about a dozen. And there's no way to just say, to render the concept in, in fewer words, at least not, um, not um, elegantly. So, um, you know, you can look at these if you're interested or not, um, but that I wanted to give a few examples of what captured for me both the joys and the, the headaches of working with them. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, one of the reasons I even agreed to do this translation because I don't generally like to do, I, I actually don't like to do retranslations, is that, um, the sort of authoritative versions of Benjamin are, are much more faithful to the word order, and there's there's a place and a reason for that. But it wasn't it wasn't the the elegance and smoothness that I was hearing, the sort of suggestiveness and the evocativeness of Benjamin's style. So on the one hand, that was very intimidating. I told a friend of mine who's a German professor that I was going to do this retranslation. She said, "Oh no, oh, you're stepping into a viper's nest. They are so territorial." But on the other hand, it was like then I thought, well, if that's the case, then I'll just I'll just recreate what I hear. And so um, once I sort of got past those impressions, it was enjoyable, but even impossible. <laughs> so so those are that's my that's my view of translating. Thank you. That's fascinating, and it's so beautiful how you know it. Uh, it seems that the language itself um, is sort of, you know, in accord with Benny Mead's project, particularly in this essay, in terms of resonances and telling. Um, and it's so beautiful. And thank you so much, you too. It's so thrilling to listen to you. Um, so, uh, as a novelist, unsurprisingly, I'm most interested in um, what Benny Mead, uh, can you hear me all right, Chloe? Okay. Um, what Benny Mead has to say about the novel. Um, and a line I uh, you know, one of many lines I underlined and got stuck on. Um, it's a very simple one. He says, someone reading a novel is solitary, more so than any other reader. And 
I think a word like solitary, especially when we're, you know, um, investing in this notion of communicable shared experience, might seem to be at odds um, with that project. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of uh, connotes, you know, atomization and um, a, a lack of shared experience. Um, but I think, as, as Ajay was saying, so much of this work is, um, <laughs> it's very, um, you know, it's a kind of positive attitude <laughs> running through uh, this essay. Um, and so, you know, this, this isn't cause for lament, the fact that someone reading a novel <laughs> is solitary, quite the opposite. Um, and uh, it's actually, you know, um, and I, I hope I can try and speak to how and why, so much a part of this, this very salutary project of, you know, shared experience. Um, so Benjamin writes, Benjamin writes, the, the reader jealously takes possession of the novel. Um, and the thing that, that happens, I think, <laughs> when someone reads a novel is that that story is, is remade and retold through the reader's individual subjectivity. And there is nothing isolating about this. Um, and in fact, I might venture that there is something, and here I wonder whether we should all be playing like Frank Burt's school bingo, uh, dialectical, <laughs> um, about this um, process because you know, the novel, we can all read the same story, uh, novel, and, you know, if ten of us were, I don't know, to read War and Peace, we would probably give congruent summaries of the plot and the characters, and yet none of us would have had the same experience because reading requires us to bring our own experience. So there's a kind of inflection of our own subjectivity with, you know, what would, might seem to be the kind of concrete, fixed, um, you know, the words on the page of the story. Um, and I was very taken with this line from um, the French philosopher Régis Debray, um, who I think was speaking about literature in the broadest sense. He wasn't kind of engaging in the, the sort of novel chauvinism that I am. Um, but he says, writing collectivizes individual memory, reading individualizes collective memory. Um, so I think this relates to um, what Ajay was suggesting in terms of, um, you know, storytelling as a, a kind of potentially emancipatory act. Um, and then I've been thinking, you know, what, what is happening in terms of storytelling in the novel now? What is happening in the novel now? Which is something I'm always thinking about, um, sometimes with despair, and I'll try not to despair too much as I um, continue to think about that aloud. Um, I think right now, and, and Suki, this, this sort of relates to what you were saying, there is this danger of, of conflating fact with truth. Um, I, I was really uh, delighted when um, what I think was a, is a really great short story, Cat Person, went viral, and you know, I'm not sure we've ever been able to use that word about a short story before. Um, maybe if the lottery went online when it did, that would have gone viral. You know, it went viral in terms of letters to the editor. But anyway, um, you know, that to me was very exciting that so many people were talking about a short story in the New Yorker. What I found dismaying about that um, was that it seemed that so much of the online reaction to that story received the story as essentially a personal essay, as a kind of testimony, as an account, rather than a piece of fiction. Um, and <laughs> this is worrisome to me. Um, I fear we are forgetting what fiction is, and you know, what, what the point of fiction is, and just how to read a piece of fiction. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to talk some more about the, the rise of the personal essay, the better and the worse. Um, and I don't want to sort of hog that topic. But it does seem that there is this, this link between um, the rise of global fascism, I don't know if that's on your bingo cards as well, um, and the, <laughs> always, <laughs> there we go. Um, and the, um, you know, the, the coarsening, hardening effects of that, 
Um, and uh, Zygmunt Bauman in Moral Blindness um, writes this, which I thought was um, illuminating. Um, a martyrdom seeking politics has become, in our world, overwhelmed with total indifference, an efficient tool of attention seeking, if not a passport to the heaven of recognition. Um, so there is this question now of how the novel sort of competes, even though that's an ugly word, with the personal essay. And I'm very excited about the ways it is doing so, and very heartened just to get back on the positive vibes. Um, and I think it's very, it, one sort of phenomenon I'm, I'm really interested and very excited by, and which I think really relates to this essay, is um, uh, these novels, or at least works of you know, literature, sort of fictive works, even if we can't quite call them novels, um, which are interpolating, if not wholly relying on collective testimony to render trauma. So it, the, there's a kind of, you know, often literal polyphony. Um, so I'm thinking of Claudia Rankine's Citizen, um, uh, sort of ostensibly a work of poetry, but also a work of criticism. It was actually nominated in both categories for the um, National Book Critics Circle Award. And it won in poetry. Um, make of that what you will. Um, you know, which includes, uh, you know, testimonies, verbatim testimonies. Um, and also the work of Svetlana Aleksevich. Um, I'm thinking also, even though um, he's writing about Lincoln and the Civil War, <laughs> all of us, you know, can, can see how those echoes are resounding, especially uh, distinctly in America right now. Um, George Saunders, um, who in Lincoln in the Bardo, a wonderful novel, has both a sort of um, fictive polyphony of many different voices of these ghosts, but also a literal one in that he includes, you know, real letters, excerpts of real people's real letters, um, sort of throughout the novel, which I found very moving. Um, but, but I think maybe one of the most interesting, particularly in terms of it enacting a very the storyteller esque move, um, is Valeria Luiselli, who wrote one book of non fiction, you know, certifiably non fiction, uh, about the crisis at the border and migrant children, um, called Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions. And then she wrote a novel uh, called Lost Children Archive, which sort of revisits that same territory. Um, you know, I think there is a, a sort of self plagiarizing, even if. Uh, you know, it's a very um, commendable kind of self-pleasurizing. Um, and in, that, in the former, in the, the work of nonfiction, um, she writes, the story continues, the only thing is to tell it over and over again as it develops, bifurcates, knots around itself, and it must be told because before anything can be understood, it has to be narrated many times, in many different words, and from many different angle, angles, by many different minds. And that to me seems such a beautiful echo of, you know, a line from the storyteller when Benjamin says the perfect story is revealed through the stratification of numerous retellings, which of course we see in this in this collection as a whole, you see the, the self-plagiarizing um, and yeah, the, the retellings. Um, and so um, to return to that idea of the, the solitary um, reader, the, I've been thinking about this, this sort of crisis of interiority um, and related to that what Benjamin might mean by experience in this essay, or at large. Um, and I suspect, and I'll, I'll um, you know, I want to sort of <laughs> defer to my panelists, but my sense is that he is talking less about what happened and more about how a person reflects on what has happened to them and how that then becomes communicable and thus witnessed, shared, and part of a story, whether or not that story uh, is written down or not. Um, so maybe that will uh, lead us into the realm of the personal essay. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, yeah, let's let's give them a round of applause.
So I do want to um, just drill down a little deeper into the term experience, which everybody up here is reflecting on in different ways and is so key to the essay. Um, I'm sort of assuming everyone here has read the storyteller essay at some point, but one of the key theses of the piece is that um, stories communicate experience and the loss of storytelling and modernity is bound up with a loss in, I think, both the capacity to have experience or to experience as well as to communicate experience or what kind of counts as a communicable experience. Um, and I guess I wanted to start by asking kind of openly and generally what people think the boundaries of the community that Benjamin is referring to are. Like, is this a universal? Is, is that the ideal of storytelling that's universal? Because what Ajay was talking about, you know, storytelling's connection to political consciousness, you know, like, that sort of implies that you would have a rather broad base of people involved. And I wonder if we really want to say that we have lost storytelling so much as maybe we want to say it has broken apart, right? And that there are groups who speak for themselves or, or, or to themselves. I mean, Benny means two figures of the storyteller or the farmer and the seafaring captain. I mean, today we might say that neither of those people might speak for me. I mean, so I just, I want to kind of raise that as a question about the scope of the community that communicable experience is dealing in. Whoever wants to, I have questions, you guys. I think he speaks quite clearly that about storytelling as a craft, right, as opposed to a kind of like a high art form, um, and that as such, it's kind of interwoven with these like these two figures, right, the farmer and the seafarer. Out there, it's not just them; it's and they're that profession, but it's what they're emblematic of, which is the person who stays put and the person who travels far. Um, and that both of them, uh, through those experiences, kind of uh, are able to assimilate, right? That, like, that term is so key for them, right? To assimilate experience, to make it one's own, and thus to be able to pass it on. So, I mean, I think that the, when he's, he's speaking, it does have a kind of, you know, pre-modern, pre-industrial kind of folk quality uh, to it. Um, but I think he's also cognizant that right storytelling, that these, these are, there are different cultures of storytelling, there are different traditions of storytelling that function, um, and they have each of their own kind of uh, unique features. But it is, it is, but it is, it is like something that he associates with with, with a folk and craft rather than again some, some certain like high art. Right, and crucially in small groups, certainly right. Like that's the scene of story. When we hear storytelling now, I just think of branding. Right, like the corporate advertising, it's all about what's your story, like what's the story of this product? Yeah, I mean, it's like, whatever, we all know what it is. But, I mean, that seems to me the bad version, the mass market version of storytelling, right? And what's at stake here are these scenes, but then I wonder how they feed into what we would call a broader political consciousness. Um, should I come on that? Yeah, um, so I feel like the, the bad version, you know, yeah, it, it's, um, if you ever read, uh, I can't remember which, I, I ran through so many in my little winter, I can't remember which ones I hit. Um, but if you ever read The Author as Producer, this is really famous that um, we're betting it's like, and you know, like maybe if the Soviet experiment works out, like every writer, every reader will become a writer. <laughs> and like everyone I teach that essay to today is like, this is like the utopian version of a YouTube, of the YouTube comment section. But like, you know what that's like, it sucks. <laughs> like, um, and I, I do think that there's like something to that, like, and Benjamin knew that. Uh, this like, he had this ongoing. You know, it's funny you know, it's sort of Frankfurt, the Frankfurt School sort of specter. He had this ongoing debate with Adorno, uh, and Adorno did think he was a little bit starry eyed. Um, and he was an optimist, right? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, he's really like, he's like super. He's not like being like super melancholic. And there is a very melancholic sort of vibe on some of these. Yeah, but compared to Adorno's theory. <laughs> an optimist, or a, something like that. Um, but so you have the yeah, you have the bad version of the comment section, um, the bad version of the storytelling that as brand new experience. Um, there was some you know that both uh, you know uh, both um, Hermione and Susie raised uh, that I wanted to connect that I think helps answer this, which is the sort of a solitary experience or price of sort of interiority, and then so you mentioned fairy tales and agadot, right? Um, and for people who don't know that phrase, like agadot or agadot, those are like the illustrative stories that appear in the Talmud that help explain, like, that surround, like, Jewish washing. Like, why should we have seven half shells worth of wine? 
So it's specifically not universal. Um, it's something that people don't share 100%. But he's, he's also very specific about what counts as a story. And oh, yeah. his prime illustration is the story of um, Semenidus, who was a king um, captured by the Egyptian pharaoh. I hope I get my nationalities right. Um, and he, it, it's a story told in Herodotus, taken up in Mutania and Benjamin traces this um, story and its various retellings in Bloch and Benjamin and others. So the king is paraded before the pharaoh, and the pharaoh wants to humiliate him, and so he parades the king's daughter by dressed as a servant, and it's clear that she's being consigned to a life of slavery. The king doesn't flinch. Uh, the son, the king's son, is taken by in shackles off to be executed and the king is in flourish. Then an old servant goes by, all bent and in chains, and the king bursts into tears. And so the question is, why did he react that way, seeing the servant and not his own children? And you know, Benjamin makes a big deal about this, saying, you know, that the beauty of it is Herodotus doesn't tell us why. But Herodotus actually does. It's just that Benjamin yeah. leaves that off. Huh. Yeah. Um, that's right. And, and, so, so relationship to source material. And then he, then he goes through the different possibilities raised by Montaigne, raised at a dinner party when he was there with his lover and two friends. And they each gave their theory about what was with the king, whether, you know, when the experience was so close that it was his own family, you know, he just couldn't take it. But when it was a little distance, saying it, the servant, he broke down, you know, or seeing the servant was the straw that broke the count's back, or, you know, they go through these various things. But the point, my point is tr really that um, Benjamin's use of the story is rather prescriptive here. And so when he talks about the communicable experience, you know, there's that line about um, in poverty and experience that our poverty is not just a poverty of experience, an impoverishment, impoverishment of experience on the personal level, it's an impoverishment of experience in humanity as well. And I think I, I, I think I put that on the, um, oh no, I didn't put it on yours. The one reason I put it down is that I translate it very differently than Island of Jennings, the, the, the standard thing, because to me, what he was talking about was an impoverishment of private experience. Um, but Island and Jennings translate, I'll read the line in my translation. Let's, let us admit it, our poverty of experience is not only an impoverishment of private experience, but is a human experience as a whole. It is therefore a new kind of barbarism. Yes. And they had, indeed, let's admit it, our poverty of experience is not merely poverty on the personal level, 
but poverty of human experience in general. And I thought that didn't get to the loss that um, Benjamin is addressing with the loss of the storyteller and people experience. I'm so glad that you brought up that bit from Herodotus, because something I wanted us to talk about is exactly that explanation, right? Explanation is this important term that's kind of running under the essay. Right? And so what many mean, he says there's kind of two moments that I think are important about explanation. One is when he says that basically a good story lacks an explanation. And I actually tested this out tonight on my kid, um, who, you know, every, every night at dinner, tell me a story. So tonight I was like, okay, I'm going to tell you a story with zero explanation in it. And he was spellbound. So I mean, just Benjamin is right about that. Um, but so he says that good stories or true stories, whatever, lack explanation. We don't know why the king. We're not told why the king, you know, acknowledged the servant and not the children. And then he says that in, the problem with information is that it over explains. And so I have a lot of questions. Like one, is that true of information today? Because I'm bombarded with information and don't feel that it has explanatory power, actually. And then my other question is like, does this connect to the thing about the personal essay, right? Is the personal essay a form in which the writer is trying to explain herself? And is that the kind of limitation of it? I just have all these questions about explanation. And it does seem connected to the bit on Proverbs, right, where he says that a proverb doesn't have a specific moral, right, but it transforms the situation. And so the story has to kind of be open so anyone can find themselves in it. Um, so I just kind of want to hear what you guys think about that whole mess of stuff. Well, what was interesting is that um, as he was writing this, these stories, this storyteller essay and working through his ideas about storytelling, he was writing stories as well. And they are almost all framed by a captain or a traveler or um, a juggler, and they are very open-ended. So the story is presented, there's usually some sort of clinch point, but no psychological shaking at all. It's all seen from the outside, which is a very cinematic experience. Um, I don't know if, it, I don't know enough about his stories, I don't know if he was happy with them or not, but that's, he was sort of stress testing his ideas in fiction as well at the same time. When, when I read that bit, I was thinking of Benjamin's own style and his nonfiction, which is so often sort of epigrammatic and, you know, kind of generatively opaque, like, what is a dream bird, you know? <laughs> um, don't explain it, just like drop some, you know, resonant but ultimately inexplicable figure of speech down with us, because that will, <laughs> it will do more than a you know, boring old explanation. Other things <laughs> are literary culture is so hostile to that. You know, like yeah. especially on the internet, right, where everyone is attacking each other all the time. You have to explain everything in case God forbid right. you would be misunderstood. Right. Yeah. <coughs> don't, don't go into it. Yeah. So on this kind of question of um, explanation, I think that you know. Ajay mentioned, uh, you know, Benjamin by no means came from like an observant Jewish household or something like this. But um, the when I read the story, um, I, I I I can't help but think about the experience of actually sitting around a uh, Passover seder table. Um, I have no idea. They never engaged in such a. If they looked anything like 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 mine do, but the. There is something almost like uncanny about the, the, the correspondence between those two exercises. Um, and right, biblical narrative also has this kind of very spare quality of a, that is not kind of shot through with explanation already, and thus kind of lends itself to this constant reinterpretation. Um, but the kind of, the, the, the right, if anyone's ever been to a Seder, what it is is this process of collective storytelling. Um, and not just that, but you are commanded that in every generation you should see yourself as if this had happened to you. Um, and thus there is this like almost imperative to try to assimilate this experience in kind of very many meaning terms and to insert yourself into the story which is still unfolding. And that is another kind of key part of the um, you know how Benjamin defines the story here that it is there's right there's no story that you can't ask and how did it go on. 
Um, then that notion of finitude is, is, is such an anathema to how he defines the story. Um, and that uh, does allow us to kind of situate ourselves in this and again to kind of make that experience our own. The, I think like, at least for me, like the contrast of like the personal essay could not be greater. Um, like I, I was, I, 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 re I recently picked up like a, a, a collection by a kind of very well-known writer, um, a lot about kind of issues of family life and children and domestic responsibilities, things that like I could relate to, but it just doesn't, it didn't speak to me at all. And, and that kind of like sense of being like uncounseled, <laughs> I found to be, um, you know, very, very, very strong in that form. And I'm not saying it's necessarily the case with every person last night, but that there is, um, that it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very, you know, different set of experiences. Yeah, I mean, I brought up, so the reason we're talking about the personal essays is because I emailed these guys today. I was like, I'm my personal essays. Um, it's just because it seems to be like this moment's idea of experience, right? Like every moment has a, a definition of experience, and I think the one in the personal essay seems to be our, our moment's working definition of experience for worse and, and you know, maybe for better. I don't know. Go ahead, Jeff. No, sorry. Um, yeah, because Christine, you had mentioned this sort of thing. There's like an anxiety in writing now that like I have you know, and I do this in my writing all the time. It's like, oh, but I didn't mean this by this. I meant that by that. And certainly not the other sort of things that you think I'm talking about. Um, and it's really funny because uh, again, to sort of bring it sort of almost like intellectual history direction, uh, this was part of Benny Means like his his um, uh, his, his overall practice. He thought this was a good thing. Um, it was part of his method, that's what I keep uh, mixing up. And again, my daughter was like, people are going to read your thing and get the wrong message. Um, and in fact, this is the thing that they did, that they did all the time. And it's not that Benjamin wasn't interested in information, um, or not interested in facts. Um, if you read Benjamin's stuff, um, for example, like the, the, some of the super famous stuff on like the Flume Door or on the arcade, so like all this stuff, he's like super, like almost obscenely interested in like the, the real facts of the matter. So it's like, oh, here's this person who looks like an urban dandy, but oh, secretly they get paid like seven francs an hour to like write gossip columns. Like, but he's like really interested in this kind of oh, it's like the people from the newspapers are really interested just in like getting the price of sheep across Europe and like whatever the new brand is. Like, he's really interested in that kind of class, a very almost like a thicker version of a classic Marxist critique. But he really believes that there's no space for the person in the argument. And this is a weird way to do, frankly, argument. Uh, but if there's no space for the person in the argument, that there is no opportunity for like us as readers or for us as listeners. And I do think he plays and uh, more of like like your transition from much of this, like because you write in this way. Um, he, he really does play between sort of reader and listener or like speaker and writer all the time. Um, he imagines that we have to have a place to enter. Um, and it's really interesting that uh, Hermione, you had raised before, like a writer like Alexia, because her method is so similar to Benjamin's. Uh, it, like, like, right? She thinks like she doesn't lead you down the garden path a hundred percent, but she gives you the juxtapositions, right? He also called his method literary montage, right? Maybe one thing and another thing, and you're going to figure out. Again, as Bruno said, they're going to figure it out at all. Better to help them how to figure it out. And you know, the funny thing is like. It's easy to, you know, punching bad Adorno sometimes. Um, but the one time he gave, uh, Benjamin gave into Adorno on this is the end of the work of art essay. And Benjamin did just lay it out. It's like, I'm going to explain the whole thing. It's about fascism. And here's how fascism works. And it's like economic argument that pushes into a militarism argument, pushes into a aesthetic argument. And it's probably some of the best explanation I've ever read. So, like, you can come down on both sides. I, but uh, in the end, I will say this. And, Susie began by reading those headlines, uh, and that's exactly what Ben do. It's not so much information or facts, it's the way in which these things can be presented as sort of like in an unconnected constellation, a constellation where there's no causality, where there's no meaningful uh, connections, in which the, the, the sort of crystallization or the chemical composition of what is creating the world is completely ignored, and the stuff just bombards us like darts in the air. Yeah, non diagenetic to use this <laughs> word. <laughs> so I wonder if you all could be Benjaminian for a moment and, um, you know, think about our 
you know, political historical moment, if we were going to take on these issues now, what genres might we be thinking about? What forms might we be thinking about? Um, you know, maybe there's two ways to get in. One is through thinking about labor, right? Benny Mean writes about the, these literary forms and their connection to the kinds of labor that people do. And then he's talking about the situation of boredom, you know, as Susie said, and I think absolutely correctly that most of us today deny ourselves the experience of boredom, right? We just self-soothe mostly with our devices, so we never have to feel bored. But there are some situations in which we still feel bored. And like, I know that when I listen to a podcast, I'm half listening usually. And I wonder if that is potentially a revolutionary Benjamin space of some kind. So I just wanted to hear you guys kind of speculate how you would bring this essay into this moment. Yeah, I mean, but to get more people reading novels means, you know, an overall <laughs> contemporary life, so I don't know. I mean, it is very strange that, um, or maybe it's not strange, um, that, you know, we are supposedly living in the golden age of TV, which would suggest there is, um, uh, you know, an investment in or a, a receptivity toward stories. Um, but I guess I <laughs> I sort of think of TV um, in the same way I think of those headlines, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's not dietetic, <laughs> it's entertainment, and I think, you know, this is a, a crucial and age-old distinction between art and entertainment. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I don't know how we, how we get people more into art than entertainment, um, and I think boredom plays a, a large part in that. Um, yeah. It, <laughs> a big ask. I mean, I don't really watch television, and I'm a bit of a Luddite, but I think that for me, the, the most immediate transposition of the storyteller, Benjamin and the Benjaminian storyteller phenomenon, is cinema. So not Hollywood, and not TV, because TV's only determined, you know, the scripts have to make sense, and they have to follow, they have to be digestible. But the kind of film that is open-ended, where you know it, you have um, people talking about movies that are can be interpreted in, in various ways, and I think that's one of the few um, areas where you get that kind of um, you know overlap uh, between you know classes, races, age, all the sort of vectors can, um, not always, but they can intersect through the movies. So that's, and the novels, as much as I love them, seem to be getting more determined to less, not less. Um, I could not make it through the mouse guard because I just don't care. <laughs> I do <don't know. laughs> not. Many of my friends who are, you know, otherwise share many of my tastes, um, were completely enthralled, so I don't get that. But for me, that was completely too overdetermined, and therefore I couldn't. I have no access. I have no access to it. Okay. Um, this is a really interesting. One. Um, it's funny because you start with the podcast example and the sort of like you're half listening. And like he, he like kind of loves that shit. Yeah, I mean the problem with the podcast, I think, is that it's probably too informative. Yeah, to, like it's not really doesn't yeah, really. It's not really about this folk. No, yeah, but it's it, it's story. It's, it's funny because he does have in this essay and in the work of art, he has that distracted learning. Yeah. And and um, again, this is something that's very controversial, right? Um, the idea that uh, some of the people he's interested in, for example, Baudelaire, um, he thinks he writes for a distracted audience. Like that's sort of like that's what makes the way interesting, and you know part of Ben means critique. He has a critique of the novel right? as being sort of interior, which wall, this kind of stuff. Um, doesn't he hate right? Like so, some of his best like he lines Proust for all its worth, right? Uh, Kafka. He really, really runs with Kafka. Um, so he clearly sees that there's something you can do with the form. Um, but I do think he's actually interested in sort of jabbing at that or blurring that line between um, art and entertainment. Like he is like, and this could be just him being wrong again. I don't know. It's like, nope. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, and not, and not only cinema. Um, you know, we were talking, we were chatting before the the event. 
Um, about sort of this kind of question about sort of Benjamin and contemporary media, the internet, things like this. And the late uh, Miriam Hansen, who was a great uh, cinema theorist, film theorist, uh, sort of uh, film critic and, and general critical theorist, uh, sort of had a great line about Benjamin in her last book where she was like, all the stuff that people say about Benjamin in cinema kind of actually, right, and reproducibility and all this kind of stuff, and mass audience, right, we can all be thinking of the same image in the same moment, actually works better for the digital world than it did for the, you know, on the graphic one. Where actually, like, texture still exists, right? Actually, one person <coughs> is not exactly the same as one of the text. Um, so I do think that they're, like, he is playing with that. Like, what is it in our moment? I mean, I think, yeah, I think uh, genres of the internet, I do actually think, like, uh, digital things, um, not to turn into some kind of like techno optimist though, right? And I think this is, again, where that play where it's like, it's neither the theory of progress nor the theory of decline comes in. Um, I bought the, I'll read one thing on this, because it's, I think it's too good not to. Because um, it gives you a good sense of Benjamin's attitude towards uh, facts and experience and also, frankly, politics. So he says, uh, da, 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 da. the notion of the class work, this is from uh, One Way Street, a couple years earlier than the essay we've been talking about. The notion of the class work can be misleading. It does not refer to a trial of strength to decide the question who shall win, who be defeated, or to a struggle whose outcome is good for the victor and bad for the vanquished. To think in this way is to romanticize and obscure the facts. For whether the bourgeoisie wins or loses the fight, it remains doomed by the inner contradictions that in the course of development will become deadly. The only question is whether its downfall will come through itself or through the proletariat. The continuance of for the end of 3,000 years of cultural development will be decided by the answer. History knows nothing of the evil infinity contained in the image of the two wrestlers locked in eternal combat. The true politician reckons only in dates, and if the abolition of the bourgeoisie is not completed by an almost calculable moment in economic and technical development, a moment signaled by inflation and poison gas warfare, all is lost. Before that, the spark reaches the dynamite, the lighted fuse, before the spark reaches the dynamite, the lighted fuse must be cut. The interventions, dangers, and tempi of politicians are technical, not chivalrous. Um, so, right, this is called a fire alarm. It's from One Way Street. And Right, it's a fragment, you're invited in. But he's, actually, he's interested in us thinking about uh, calculability, facts, information, right? But like, what were you, like, this is also something people love to quote for ecological books, you know why, right? His theory of revolution is not like eternal, it's not Trotsky, right? it's not eternal revolution, it's emergency break, it's cutting the views. Um, but there is an idea that we, it, like, if somehow you can invite people into this kind of thinking, right? Is that the, that's it. That's the fact that the whole lesson, or the whole fragment. Um, but if, you, if there's space for you in there, and whatever the contemporary version of that is, is it like, I mean, I'm going to quote because I'm not saying it's memes. Uh, maybe, like, like, is it podcasts? Is it, uh, I've written about games? Like, is it these things? I don't know. Um, I mean, you don't think so. I don't want that to be people's. I don't want to. No, that should not be the takeaway. I don't think that should be the takeaway. But I also don't think the takeaway should be uh, that Benjamin Cates not. But he, he thinks things might dissolve, right? Epic poetry eventually dissolves. Um, but he still thinks there's things to be like reclaimed from him. I'm going to be like ever so contrarian here. I honestly don't think that anything can fill the story's shoes. Uh, much as I would like it to be true, and like the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, the, for the primary reason that the story is kind of intertwined with death and with this humanity that did not yet try to escape it, and I think that mode of thinking about our own demise is just so incredibly foreign and not we we can't recapture it, um, and that the um, and. Yeah, and and, and, I, and honestly, I think that in the um, you know the the thing that we should now be mourning the loss of is the novel, um, as the novel is kind of caught up with this time in which you could kind of transverse different subjectivities and um, and you know and, and 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 have that kind of like act of kind of compassion or empathy that's required to write different characters or to see yourself in them that that 
that maybe that is a thing that we should now be kind of like, like mourning the loss of as different genres come to replace it, much in the same way that Benny made at his time, was kind of mourning the loss of the story. And that it's not going to be surprising, right? These things are kind of a classic materialist take. These art forms are tied up with different kind of modes and stages of capitalism. Um, so maybe neoliberalism just gives us the first and last thing. And so that's. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up death, because that was going to be the last thing I raised before opening the floor to everyone. Um, so just to refresh everyone's memory, Benjamin says a few things about death in this essay. Um, death is what grants authority to the storyteller. Um, and yet, of course, as we've been saying, the story is by definition open-ended. So there's some way in which this ultimate finality creates the possibility of a kind of open-endedness. He also writes that the storyteller allows the wick of his life to be consumed by the flame of the story, right? Which I read as kind of creating a space for the next, for the listener to kind of take the story over, over as her own. And then the novel, we get a different picture of death from the novel. Um, this is, I'm just kind of paraphrasing from the translation, but it's uh, the reader is warming herself at the fire of someone else's death, which I actually think is a wonderful description of what happens when you read a novel. I, mean, I never would have come up with it. <laughs> it's beautiful and true. Um, but so I just kind of wanted us to sort of tease out a little bit of what we think death is doing in this argument, and then we will open it up to everyone. Yeah. Tess, do you have any thoughts based on what it was like to translate those passages? Death becomes, I think for him, at least in a series of, of um, pieces, um, death is kind of the, the mobilizing force. And he's, he distills it most distinctly in the piece on Abel. And in fact, does he uses this passage twice because he does that. Um, where he says sort of one of the epitome of storytelling for him is the passage in Unexpected Reunion by Yohan Peter Cable, where in a single paragraph you get a span of 50 years. And so he goes through all the things that, that happen, and it's basically a living of death. <coughs> death and destruction, but mostly death. And so death is, is devastating, but it's kind of the renewal. And that's the problem with the veterans of World War One is they didn't die and they can't they can't put their brush with death into words and that's sort of one of the sources of their their inner impoverishment not just the trauma of death but they have this trauma and, and nothing to do with it. Susie, did you want to say more because you you brought up death? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, he has all of these kind of you know very evocative phrases, which Tess has like rendered really beautifully about kind of like the Grim Reaper appearing in this almost like processional, and that death is this just regular figure in the story. Um, and he relates this to just a, a historical fact that right that death is not excised from the you know the, the realm of the living in the you know until the kind of modern period. And then, you know, this, this notion, right, he'd be so horrified looking around at all of these apartment buildings in which no one has died. All of these, all of these brand, these new apartments and these rooms where no one has died. And that when, when someone gets sick, we like, you know, as it says, you ship them off to either the hospital or the sanatorium. Um, that we, we, don't, we don't want our graveyards beside the town anymore. They're no longer spaces for strolling and picnics, right? Uh, and much as like people are trying to like do that grief with again, but like that there was a, a different relationship with death that corresponded with a different relationship to the notion of eternity. Um, and as that has declined, so too has our comfort and our ability to assimilate death as part of the story that is kind of unavoidable. And that you know there is this like cyclical nature, right? As you mentioned, right? death is kind of destruction but also renewal. And to place yourself in the story means to um, to come to terms with that, and you're, that you are a rung in the ladder, but you are not the last one, um, and that the ladder goes up and the ladder goes down, but that like you are part of this chain. Um, and I just think that the capacity to do that is so undermined by various conditions of our modern life. I'm actually going to open it up now. Okay. Okay, so does anybody want comments, questions, questions directed to one person, to everyone? Thank you, everyone. This was very
very, very interesting. So it's not a question, it's a comment and some thoughts, uh, maybe in defense of the personal essay. Uh, this was fascinating and, and, a, and a few um, allusions came up which I thought were really apt. Uh, the Passover story and Valeria Luisetti and her story about, can you hear me about this? Where's the man? <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, in defense of the personal essay, maybe through Valeria Luiselli, and why I think it's interesting to put her in conversation, well, first of all, with Benjamin, because um, one of her Spanish language novels, Sidewalks, has been compared to the Arcades Project, Benjamin's Arcades Project, so she's very interested in storytelling, as you pointed out. And the Passover Seder, where you have to tell this story, and it's very clear why we tell the story, or why the story is told, memory is part of it. We're all supposed to remember, you no, know, we, the people around the table, that we were persecuted. And with someone who grew up in Israel, I know that these stories can go in all kinds of directions, and that memory can be kept. Can global fascism. Yes, exactly. So the, the burden of, of memory um, becomes a possibility there as well. But what's very clear is why the story should be told, or at least that's something that um, is explicit. You must tell the story because you must remember um, this, that, that you were um, a foreigner. Which brings us to Luisei, who, who of course tell this, tells the story, the stories of foreigners. And what's so interesting about her choice of speaking in the first person and, and essentially writing a personal essay in 10 questions, as she calls it, and, and tell me how it ends, is that there's this great discomfort around storytelling. She tells the stories of children. She needs to translate these stories because these children don't speak English. This is why she's there to tell the stories of their exodus, if, if, if you will, and, and she can't quite find the right way to do it. So maybe speaking of the genres that we choose to tell contemporary stories, when, when we don't quite know how to tell each other stories, that maybe that personal voice becomes pertinent. It's Absolutely. just a suggestion. Oh yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, that, that was very true and very beautiful. And I think there is, um, you know, I think that's a sort of an honesty of subjectivity when it comes to these days. She's kind of, you know, heading, heading it straight on. Um, and I should say, you know, in case it sounds like I've just been dunking on a genre as a whole, you know, I mean, James Baldwin wrote personal essays, Joan Didion wrote personal essays, there are, you know, rightly canonical, wonderful personal essays. I think what, what we're in danger of in terms of the personal essay right now is this, this really pernicious idea that a terrible thing that happened to me is instantaneously of literary value, um, rather than it being about how I think about the terrible thing, how the terrible thing might relate to the world at large, and how you know there might be some generosity um, within the solipsism of the personal essay. So I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> I keep returning to the idea that uh, a distinction might need to be made between mythic story and narrative story here, and the technology by which we translate cultural myths might have shifted over the century, and like perhaps was shifting underneath the ground uh, when Benjamin Benjamin wrote this. So I just wanted to open up. That question. Yeah, I'm happy to talk on that. Uh, one of the things that they mean, very shit, very clean in our agreement, they weren't always like, um, uh, is the idea that 
and sort of uh, uh, like we try to overcome it. Um, so this is like the famous thesis of the doctrine of Lightman, right? Like, oh, we use capital R reason, like super rationality, to overcome myth, and then of course, in, in the attempt to overcome myth, you mythologize reason itself, yeah, 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 right? We can all apply that to the cow comes on. Um, one of the things that Benjamin says here about overcoming myth is that story is different. Um, and interestingly connected to the, to the last, um, to the last uh, comment, uh, he, he also says that uh, in addition to the seafarer and the farmer, yeah, yeah, the seafarer, you have know, some merchants as well, but, it's, but yeah, seafarers and farmers, but also that the most effective stories begin with that, or he pretends it's me, right? He says, I. Um, but it is, of course, a pretense. Um, and we can somehow uh, translate that. So, uh, like, to deal with the question you're asking, uh, is like, he, he thinks the audience, uh, through to, like through changes, and here I want to be specific. It's not just modernity; it's capitalist modernity, he's, and he's quite specific about that as well. And it's why when he like he has this sort of mixed reception of the Soviet Union when he does it, he's like, well, they kind of fix some stuff, but not really. It's okay, but he's still willing to say it's different. He, is, he does not have the same say a Redman or a Dornan Jesus on totalitarianism. Um, but he says, look, like technology and modern forms do seem to have changed the way in which people can receive um, these kinds of stories, and it could revert to mythologies. And that would be a bad, like talk about the bad forms, that would be the bad storytelling. Um, and like, that is, I mean, you know, Tess had raved the rise of global fascism, I made that joke, it was probably a little off color a moment ago. Um, but this idea, I, I wrote down from, the test, uh, not sorry, not test, uh, remind me, it's that, uh, right, the coarsening and hardening effects of some, uh, of like, of global fascism. Of global fascism, yeah. Um, I mean, Benjamin stealing them off from Freud thought that this was kind of the way in which people were responding to uh, a society that was increasingly giving them a shock experience of life. Um, that basically build up big shells to deny ourselves experience, and that somehow that's the interest in the story, right? That somehow storytelling will give us that bridge back in. And it, this, you know, the, the weird thing about it, it's very deflationary in some ways, because like he, like I actually bought Les Cobb with me, I don't know, like, like he totally takes Les Cobb as an excuse to write this essay about basically not Les Cobb. Um, but like, if you look at things like Les Tom and some of the other things he is talking about, it's not like grand literature. Um, like, it is in fact is celebrating some stuff that people would otherwise consider kind of cultural detritus, like not the main world's greatest stuff on earth. And he wants us to take it super seriously. And I think even the like very serious conversation we were just having about like death, like he doesn't want. It's not that he's doing like the being unto death stuff. Right? It's not Kierkegaard. Stuff but like, like he's not doing that. Like it's actually like by exiling death into these sort of specific spaces, we like lose touch with like just sort of like being an ordinary part of like a natural historical process. And like it is, an, and we also invent this idea of the interior bourgeois private space that he thinks is like really damaging for people. So if you're doing union or community organizing, you're, you're often in a situation um, that gets to the organizing conversation, where if you're thinking about it narrowly and instrumentally, you've got something you want this person to do, and you're trying to convince them to do it, and that thinking about it that way tends to make for bad organizing. If you think about it more expansively, you're probably um, spending as much or more time listening as you are talking, and you don't necessarily know exactly ahead of time where it's going to go. Now, often in an organizing conversation, a key moment that kind of only happens when the person you're trying to bring into the work um, arrives at it themselves, where they see that their individual story, in which they're the protagonist, in which they're the hero or the pathetic failure, in fact, is not unique that it's part of many people's stories, that there's a common story there that's impossible to see by only looking at one person's experience. You only see when you look at many people's experience together. Um, but I guess I'd like to invite responses on that, some of the descriptions of the different ways and meanings of experience or memory brought this to mind, although that might be misleading, maybe it's so different that it's not a comparison, I don't know. 
Um, the question I'd like to pose, besides more general reflection, is what do you see in contemporary life in the U.S. today? What do you see as the elements are our sort of material condition of existence that might help us see that bigger story in which the protagonist is all of us, or could be, and what are the parts of the way we live now that push us away from that recognition? Well, I could speak very briefly to the first part, um, just to say that what you were saying sort of reminded me of one of the, the maxims of writing workshop, which, you know, uh, like all cliches, is, is kind of value, really. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, the, the way to attain the universal is through specificity, you know. So if, if a writer of fiction is trying to speak to the universal, it's, it's going to be a kind of, you know, a, a blankness, a kind of vague, diffuse nothingness. But, but the way you get to a felt truth is, you know, through, yeah, individual, specific, uh, odd <laughs> experience. Um, the, the second part of your question is <laughs> unwieldy and what? <laughs> so uh, I'll pass that one over. <laughs> I'll start with the question. This, um, the, uh, I mean, I think the, 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 the kind of part about the organizing and the kind of seeing yourself in this kind of collective story, I think is, is, is actually quite beautiful. And it does resonate uh, with um, how Benjamin speaks of the storyteller, right? That the storyteller's experiences are not just his, but they're of everyone else's that he's heard. And he has this unique capacity to relate to all of them as if they are his. Um, and I think that that type of thing would just be like shot down in many circles as like some sort of like terrible appropriation um, uh, in, in, in contemporary life, but it kind of gestures at this um, almost like need to, yes, to see ourselves not in kind of this, as like the solitary individual, um, but to be in, in this kind of like deeply overlapping sense, uh, um, you know, in, engaged in some sort of common project. And in terms of how we make that more apparent, um, uh, I think it, there has to be a like material element of pushing back against those forces that are bent on dividing us. Um, you know, people talk about the kind of like divisiveness of contemporary politics in these really moralistic terms, as if it kind of like comes out of nowhere. Um, and that is not true. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <Speaking of clarity. laughs> I, you know, I think that understanding the, um, uh, you know, they're understanding the way in which this divisiveness functions in order to shore up a status quo that works for fewer and fewer people is very crucial here. Um, and divisiveness doesn't just happen because some people are like morally abject and can't possibly, you know, extend a hand to a neighbor or something like this. I mean, there are people like that, but like, I generally think that as we're talking about this as a cultural phenomenon, we have to think about what work that kind of divisiveness does um, and whose interest it ultimately serves. I'll just add one tiny thing there. We have to divide that up because it's too, too much office. Um, the, one of the other like uh, contemporary activities or activities that Benjamin is interested in is gambling. Um, and again, you know, Part of that invite people in to let them do with it what they will with the material, even though you're state, you're setting it up, right? It's a montage. If I set up like the knife and the, the you know the handcuff, right? If I set up the, the knife in the shower, we all get scared. Like so I can set that up and you might into that and be like, oh, it's totally so sweet, right? Like, like it's a gamble. Um, Benjamin thinks that sort of all of political life is kind of this kind of gamble. It's like waiting for the moment and then rolling the dice. He thinks it's worth it to do that. And when, when you were telling the story about you organizing and listening, that is, from, like if I was to use a Benny Minion lens on that, that's letting in the moment. And that's like that for people to come in and, and you as the organizer have to sort of roll the dice. And this is a very weird way of thinking about what political education is, right? Like we often talk about, we do education, but like if you do political education, it's often like, what catechism do you teach? Um, but really, like it's often, at least if you follow Benjamin's theory, it would be like inviting people in and, and rolling the dice and being like, hey, uh, how are you going to use these materials? Uh, 
thank you for the conversation. Um, I'm curious uh, what actually all the conversation and questions um, was bringing to mind uh, three figures of like, uh, or one book in particular, I guess, uh, Benjamin's The Origin of, um, of uh, The Origin of Drama, tra like a German <laughs> tragedy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. So, um, utilizing that type of form of, of art in order to portray like what was happening uh, in the zeitgeist of you know Germany, um, and how that transitions even further onto like let's say someone's usage of um, of like uh, audio materials like Ling Gould, uh, how he would utilize it to interact with with the um, the, the audience from not even being with the audience. And then kind of like going like to Zabal and his the immigrants and how he would kind of like insert himself uh, into like these narratives, then using like pictures that, that according to him may not have actually been part of like the story, but just as a way in order to like uh, in a way in order to like you know show almost a sort of fact of these these stories that may have been actually fiction. So I'm curious about in this progression of how art is evolving through technology and how in today's world, at least in my eyes, it seems like there is becoming a sort of like a method to everything more so now. And so how in our progressions of technology, are we going to like revert maybe more back to experimentative kind of like storytelling where we're not like one we're not appropriating other stories but we're allowing enough play in order for nothing to be like monotonous like how are we going to utilize this work of Bingman's in order to like into this new uh, te like technological age that's so very strict and methodical okay. Okay. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you for that question. Um, so two things that come quickly to mind, I and mean, it's a really hard question, so it's like, I'm tempted to be very teacherly and be like, well, what do you think? <laughs> um, but that's true then for the panel. Um, we haven't mentioned Brett uh, in this, but he was in the essay, and he's, he's like, I think he's got a bunch of the angels and devils, depending on whose version of the story you're reading, on um, his shoulders, and the Dorno, uh, showing him to a certain extent. Um, uh, and Brecht is one of them. Um, and, and this idea of sort of shocking people, uh, or of, the, of, of the epic theater, for example, of the theater in which like, eventually you're gonna be so mortified at something that I do that you like get up and throw something at me, or you like yell at me, right? Like that is part of Benjamin's like, uh, uh, theory of uh, how hard it's gonna work. Um, and when you say it, it's really funny. I just finished teaching the last bit of you know Kate's project and the last bit of the work of art I said the other day to several students, and I actually had them do a listening exercise because he's a very visual, he's very visual editor. And so I was like, let's play with this in music, and I played them some Bibi Mori. I don't know if people know her. She's like, um, she does like laptop, like digital noise music. Um, she sometimes works with like John Swan and people like that. Uh, and I played some burial, which is like uh, British dance music. Um, and the funny thing is that if you listen to them together, you're like, oh, right, like, burial, like, she's doing really interesting things. If you sit there and listen to Ikimori, she's doing incredibly interesting things and, like, then wraps us and it does this kind of thing that Adorno thinks of Thomas artworks do, where, like, I'm really engaged and really have to work at it, like, all the time to make it make sense. Burial actually has a bunch of the same shit that Ikimori is doing, but it's, like, burying the background behind the sun and gravy. And the thing that's so fascinating there is like, right, that weird autonomous poking in the eye, directing an experience is happening in the background. It's something that's happening uh, to our distracted self. So the question is, is it really working or not? I don't know, but like that, that, that one of the places where I see like a big minion thing happening. Another place where Benry thought that the politically spark of political consciousness could arise was in dreams. Uh, just curious, did he ever like, write it down retelling dreams at all? 
He, yeah, he, in the, there's a collection of his stories, and many of them are actually just his dreams, right? They had a dream book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, we're gonna, oh, okay, there's one, one, one more person. Question. One more. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Um, so I think there's a common notion that, uh, as we've discussed, the experience has been impoverished. Um, and in the text, he says that experience has lost uh, its value. Yet, if I hear or look at modern today's society, experience and storytelling are becoming more and more predominant in the way that we speak or the way that we strive or look up to things. And so there, there seems to be this longing for this essential element of life that we are discussing that, is, I mean, that it seems to be lost or being, being lost. And I want to pick up back on where we left off, saying that maybe there's no other medium of retaking back what's, what we're using through storytelling and through novel, and opening it up to saying, A, the question is, if there is still this predominant use of experience and storytelling from companies to make you consume more or something like that, uh, there, is there still a longing from people to need that? And if they're not getting it, you know, no economics, if there's the demand, are we going to have a supply? So I wanted to reopen that conversation since I think it wasn't, um, didn't have a unanimous decision. Not that we will get into a unanimous decision. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like really pessimistic here. I think we'll get like shadows of it that are like commodified and like to get it. <laughs> That is the, um, but and, and we do long for it, but when we don't get it, we, ex we experience that as alienation. Um, and it's like a, it almost like a different layer of alienation from, say, kind of like classic Marxian one thinking about, about labor, um, but, and, or an additional one about like how our social relations are alienated. I don't see, though, that what has passed, you know, like from mouth to mouth here uh, in our contemporary days is like experience the way that Benjamin is talking about it. I think that it's, um, right, it is a term which is, you know, Christina, I think you mentioned, like it pops up with great regularity, and like it's on your resume, et cetera, et cetera. Or I had this great, and you have this great story that you want to relay to somebody, but that, that they almost, at least in my own personal life, feel like entertainment rather than something that has kind of given me counsel in that kind of a very, very um, uh, capacious way that many of you is imagining. Right, I'm going to jump in. I'm not really on this now. Um, but I, I guess I would just, yes, but we also know what it feels like to have experiences. And we know what it feels like to be counseled and to get counsel. So like even if on the mass political level this is a disaster, right, where we're totally atomized and alienated, there are these instances, right? Like a union might be one social formation in which this happens. I know that like a lot of activist groups now use storytelling, right? Like Sunrise Movement is all about telling your story of how you came to the movement and then finding commonality in that. And we could all come up with different, whether they are within small groups of friends, family, like we have all of these other, so even if we lost it en masse, I would just want to say that I, I don't think, I don't think we've lost it like in total. Thank There's you for like bringing us to listen to them. I think it takes me well, I would say that political rallies are the mass version of that. Each political rally, and regardless of affiliation, is a story. Or feeds off of the story or communicates well. When the person can speak in full sentences, right? Even when the person can speak in full sentences. Benny has some things to say about power. Actually, I, I want to uh, say something that connects to both what Susie and Christine were saying, because um, actually, maybe I'm a little less pessimistic than you are, Steve, which is a sort of strange turn of events. No, but simply that, um, you know, I, like, for, for a lot of my current work, and I am thinking think about Benjamin a lot in this work on ecology, um, and also that he comes up really frequently in critical works on ecology, like in this bizarre way. Um, it, uh, I think partly because of that definition of evolution I've seen before. Um, but then, like, there are these stories, right? They sort of, like, I just wrote a book on, like, greenwashed, like, hilarious stories about how, like, this, like, city bank is going gonna, is gonna, to, like, move into, like, all the new energy. And, like, the distance between that and our everyday experience of something, like, that I, I, 
time change, frankly. Um, I actually think there's like a little tease of different critical theories, much later and much less exciting, but there's a little legitimacy break there, right? Like there's a little bit of a legitimation crisis between like the story I'm being sold and the story I kind of know and the one I want to tell. Right? And, and actually, like, that is interesting, but like, that is a mass political story. I think that is one of the reasons why something like Sunrise, like the discursive breaks that they use, like, why it works. Because uh, they're telling a story that actually we can communicatively share. But if I might add just one thing, sorry, before, because when Sudi said something about describing the process of uh, the lack of experience and, or the valuable experience and finding people being alienated, I think exactly from that alienation, there, there begins the movement of actually valuable experience. Okay, there's one more hand, and that's really it. Okay, this is the last question. We're gonna to go to reception after this. This is even a question. This is like a personal essay. <laughs> No, I, just, I guess it's funny because I feel like I never have time to read novels in our day and age, and it's because I'm too busy following all these stories, which are the stories that I'm trying to put together through the information that I'm getting from podcasts and tweets and, you know, digital newspapers. And, like, the, the, the desperation that I feel because none of these stories ever add up, and none of them ever get to a point. And like, for me, I mean, I think this is like, we need journalism. Like, that's what I think we need more than anything. I don't think what I want is a great novel. But, and I don't know if Benjamin's talking about that at all, but I just feel desperate for someone to tell me the story so that I can understand it, because it's so out of control. But there's like, I mean, what do you gain from trying to follow it? Like, I, I wait, ask this to myself. I, I read the news very rarely. I like to very quick, like just personal survival techniques here, people. Like, uh, I do a very quick scan. I want to see what's going on. But I actually don't think I'm going to learn that much by clicking through and reading every single one of those things. And part of the um, part of what we have to kind of do in this kind of like the great quest of separating signal from noise is taking the time to actually get to read the novel or to engage in a, a, a real text of say political theory or social theory or philosophy. I, mean, I feel like this is like the sanity that teaching from Lindsay classes gives me is because it allows a space to process in a meaningful way what is going on without getting lost in kind of the like individual minutia. But I, again, I don't, I don't know what, to, where, what we all gain from being bombarded by this. Um, like if we feel richer, or if we feel, in, 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 if we feel somehow that we've like gained some sort of new insights. I think it's like I'm not saying like to put your head in the sand, <laughs> this is, you know, but that um, that maybe we are better off actually engaging in these things that do ask more of us, but that um, pay us back kind of in space. That offers counsel, right? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm the, you know, I am the guy who, I watch a lot of TV, I read a lot of news. Um, you bought the hand. <laughs> well, that's the thing though, that he thinks we need, that when he has that riff on barbarism, he thinks that, uh, you know, the other side needs a little barbarism. Um, and, yeah, it's like, it's very hard, because on one hand, I'm very sympathetic to this idea that most of what we read, like, in the contemporary newspaper, um, is, is trash, I'm sorry to say. Um, and here I have in mind like the New York Times and the Washington Post. I read the Financial Times because I think that's like real news, but whatever. But like also I read all the other stuff. Like I think one of the interesting things, again, yeah, I'll keep throwing again in back at the moment because I feel like it's like that's my job. Um, like something he's really interested in is, is fashion. Right, he writes an entire section in the arcades, right, unfinished on fashion. Why? Because like, if you're interested in politics and you're interested in the world and you're interested in the way in which people are thinking and what they're interested in and like what's occupying people's consciousness, you better be aware of what the current fashions are and better be aware of why this ruffle and not that ruffle this year and why like this period of time seems to be speaking to this moment and which issues. And so I do feel like he, like. There is a little bit of a, a, a positive streak that he wants to save from an otherwise horrible universe of information daily as we're talking about all the time. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>